The following is a production of New Mexico State University. We'll let everybody kind of uh, take their seats. We have some folks that I know have to head back and thank everybody uh, for coming and especially let's give a round of applause for our military men and women while they're leaving the uh, environment. We're going to get real serious now. We're going to talk about a tough, tough uh, word in government that in, when I served in government, I would actually say was almost a misnomer. It's accountability. The person I have the honor to introduce is Mr. David M. Walker. Mr. Walker has been a foot soldier. He has uh, been a man that I've had the honor of hearing speak, I probably would guess about 10 different times. He wouldn't know that, but I've counted, because he gives great, great talks, ground out in absolute truth, and he shares his vision for how this government ought to operate in a more effective, in a more efficient manner, and one where they are held accountable for the decisions they make, the programs they implement, and the overages that they have a tendency to incur. He served as our Comptroller General in the United States, and he served as the head of the Government Accountability Office from 1998 to 2008, 10 years, two different presidents, Mr. Walker, had the ear of three different presidents, if my math is correct. And those presidents asked Mr. Walker for one thing, honest counsel. And I know they got it from Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker served as a, an accountant with Arthur Anderson before he served at the GAO. He was asked to serve in the government as a trustee of the Social Security and Medicare from 1990 to 1995. He also served under the Reagan administration as an assistant secretary of labor for pension and welfare benefits. This man has been around government. This man understands how a balance sheet works, and he also understands the unique intricacies and the difficulties that bureaucrats, and I mean that in the most positive of sense, as I was one, how bureaucrats struggle with zero-based balance budget, bu budgets, how to balance a budget, and how to try to achieve goals in the very, very diff difficult fiscal environment of the federal government. I would like to introduce Mr. David Walker and thank him for joining us here in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here in New Mexico and at uh, New Mexico State University. And as several of the other speakers have said previously, when uh, Pete G Domenici calls uh, and asks you to give a speech, uh, then uh, you better have a darn good reason to say no. And, and I didn't have a darn good reason to say no. And so I was just honored and privileged to be able to say yes and to be able to get down here. Uh, he is not only a fellow fiscal responsibility patriot. Uh, he's also uh, becoming a friend. Uh, he obviously is a treasure to the state of New Mexico, uh, and I'm sure that his legacy will live on for many years, but I'm pleased to be part of this second uh, uh, annual conference that hopefully will go on for many years. Let me start by saying that as Comptroller General of the United States, I didn't work for the President. I worked for the Congress of the United States, uh, and the GAO is in the legislative branch, and we're, we basically are about promoting transparency, ensuring accountability in order to improve the economy, the efficiency, and the effectiveness of our government. And uh, we basically stated the facts, spoke the truth, told it like it was, made recommendations, and. I'm pleased to say that over 85% of our recommendations were adopted. But we were part of the accountability mechanism to be able to provide a check and balance on the executive branch, which while it does not end up uh, making the laws, it has to execute uh, with regard to those laws, and it's obviously very important. On my lapel pen, what you didn't see, what you see on my lapel, which wasn't in my bio, 
but it tells a lot about me, are two things. One is a rosette that is a rosette of the Sons of the American Revolution, of which I'm an officer, uh, and I live on property that George Washington used to own. And the other is a certified public accountant pen, and I am a certified public accountant, among other things. And so what that means is I'm a patriot who can add. <laughs> and I'm pleased to say that Pete Domenici is too, but that quite frankly, we need a lot more in Washington. We don't have that many patriots uh, who can add. And the numbers now are, have gone from millions to billions to trillions. And it's very, very important that Americans make the transition from billions to trillions quickly and effectively, because if not, we could really lose control. A billion is a thousand million, a trillion is a thousand billion, and in the 1930s, the country had to transition from millions to billions in not great economic times, and now we're having to transition from billions to trillions. And if we don't make that transition effectively, we're going to be in trouble because if people think that a few hundred billion dollars is not a lot of money, they're wrong. And that, uh, with the deficits we're dealing with now and the debt levels we're dealing with right now, that is a real risk. You know, today is Constitution Day, which is an appropriate day for us to meet, an appropriate day for me to speak, and I'll come back to that theme because it's very clear that this country has strayed from a number of the constitutional principles on which we were founded and from a number of the values that made us great, and I'll come back to that. You know, it's a little chilly outside today. I understand it's the coolest it's been in New Mexico since May, and that could be because I'm going to give you some chilling numbers and make some chilling statements, and you know what? They're all the truth, and they're all the facts. Now, I have opinions about what we ought to do about them, and reasonable people can and will differ and reasonable people should have different opinions and different ways forward, but we shouldn't differ on the facts. I, I'm, it's great that we have students and young people here because I'm talking about your future, which is at risk, and our collective future as a country. I enjoyed hearing the general, the other speakers this morning. He was talking about national security. I'm here to tell you that the largest national security risk to the United States is not terrorism. It is not a nation state. It is our own fiscal irresponsibility. We are our biggest problem. If you do not have economic strength, nothing else matters. And we are on a path to bankruptcy as a nation. We need dramatic, fundamental, transformational changes, not reforms. We don't need nip and tuck surgery. We need radical reconstruction. And we can't do it all at once. But we have to first wake up to the reality that it needs to be done. We need to start soon. We need to have a plan to execute that plan. It is a generational challenge and beyond. It is going to take a generation or more for us to be able to put ourselves in a more prudent and sustainable path, but we need to start now because if we don't, our best years may be behind us. On the other hand, if we do successfully take up the challenge, America's greatest years can be ahead of us, and that's obviously why I'm fighting for America's future along with Pete and others. I'm going to start off with talking to you about the four Ds, deficits, debt, dependency, and I'm from the South, the ditch, and I'll explain that. First, deficits. In the last three years, 
Federal deficits have gone from 162 billion, there's nine zeros to the right of that 162 without the pennies, to 459 billion, to this year, 1.6 trillion dollars. 10 times the level of deficit two years ago. That's over $4 billion a day in deficits. If you look at the debt, total federal debt of the United States is now about $11.8 trillion. By the end of this fiscal year, which is September 30, it will be approaching 85 percent of our economy. Now let's put that in perspective. To win our war of independence and to gain ratification of the greatest political document in the history of mankind, the United States Constitution, and this is, as I said, Constitution Day, the United States had total debt to GDP of 40 percent. Now why I say gain ratification of the Constitution? Because Alexander Hamilton had the arrangement to say, in order to get enough of the states to vote for the Constitution, one of the trade-offs, in addition to the capital, was the federal government would assume responsibility for the debt of the states. And therefore, our total debt, federal and state, as a percentage of our economy, was 40% of the economy, or $75 million in 1789 dollars, but we got something for it. We won our independence, we gained ratification of the Constitution, which has stood the test of time, by and large, although we've had great, some great advances. We've abolished slavery, we've, we have civil rights, we have women's suffrage, and a number of other things that obviously were flawed in the original Constitution. But the simple fact of the matter is, is that was 40% of our economy. Today, we're about 85%. Next year, we're going to be at 95, and you ain't seen nothing yet if we don't start making some tough choices. And what are we getting for it? I would ask you to answer that question, other than more interest payments. So, deficits, debt. By the way, at the end of World War II, we had the highest percentage of debt as a percentage of GDP in the history of our country, 122%. But you know, we got something for that. We defeated the Axis powers. We avoided an attack on our homeland. We saved the free world. And at the end of World War II, we were over 50% of the global economy because Europe was in ashes and Japan was in ashes and we invested in their future in order to benefit us all over time with fascism having been defeated. But there was a difference and that gets me to the third D, dependency. All of that debt was owed to Americans. Americans fought on the front lines, worked in the factories, and bought war bonds. Everybody contributed in some way. Every family was affected in some way. And so yes, we had 122 percent of GDP, but we owed it all to Americans because Americans saved. And they invested in their country's future and they invested in their family's future. Unfortunately, there's been an adverse trend since then. From zero foreign debt at the end of World War II, we had 20 percent of our debt held by the public in 1990, was held by foreign lenders, and today over 50 percent and climbing. Why? In part because our deficits are so big, and in part because our savings rates have plummeted. Starting in the last 30 years, both America and too many Americans who have been following the bad example of the federal government have been spending more money than they make, 
charging their credit cards, taking out home equity loans, mortgaging the future in order to be able to experience conspicuous consumption today. Addicted to debt. Now that started to change recently because Americans now know what a rainy day is. And they know that the too big to fail concept, which was propagated for too long, is false. AIG, Lehman Brothers, General Motors, Government Motors Corporation, I call it, just to name a few. I wonder if the, if the executives now have government plates on the car so that they won't get tickets. I don't know. You, you can find out. We can get an investigative reporter to take a look at it. But my point is, is that you know, we now have a situation where debt is 85% of our economy, going to 95, headed up from there, and we're increasingly reliant on foreign lenders. That is not in our national security, foreign policy, economic, or domestic tranquility interest. One must pay attention to your bankers. Guess what? Our bankers have already spoken. Do you remember when the Treasury Department announced that it was going to guarantee the five trillion dollars, 12 zeros to the right of that five without the pennies, five trillion dollars worth of debt of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? They weren't guaranteed. Why? Because the Japanese and the Chinese demanded it. Let me underline the word, words, demanded it because they held a lot of those bonds and we have become unduly reliant on them and other foreign lenders, including OPEC nations, to finance our excess consumption. We must get our deficits under control. We must improve our savings rates, both as individuals as well as as a country, if we want our future to be better than our past, because what is savings? Savings represents investment. With investment comes research and development. With research and development comes innovation, comes productivity improvements, quality enhancements. With that comes economic growth. With that comes jobs. With that comes improvement in our standard of living and also with all of these things, enhancement of our competitive posture. So savings matter. The good news is savings rates are up to about five to six percent among Amer American families because they know what a rainy day is. Unfortunately, the federal government is dissaving faster than individuals are saving, so we're still in the ditch. And let me now define the ditch. The ditch is actually a Grand Canyon. The ditch is the sum of total liabilities and unfunded promises for Social Security and Medicare alone. What we currently have what our current liabilities and unfunded obligations are. In 2000, the number was 20 trillion. By the way, I'm only using the numbers for the next, you know, the estimated funding balance uh, for the next 75 years, but it's how much money you'd have to have today invested at treasury rates to fund the promises, and how much do we have? Zip, zero, nada, niet. Nothing, all right? So, $2,000, 20 trillion dollars. 2008, 56 trillion dollars. How much is 56 trillion dollars? $184,000 per person, including newborn. No wonder newborn babies cry. And by the way, I told the general, I bet he's had gray hair since he was two. He did not deny the assertion. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's $483,000 per household. You know what median household income is in this country? $50,000 a year. So that means that the typical American household has an implicit second or third mortgage equal to nine to 10 times their entire household income but unlike a typical mortgage, there's no house back in this one. All you have is your citizenship. And that 56 trillion, I'm here to tell you, 
will probably be 63 trillion or higher by the end of this month. And we really won't know what that final number is until December 15th of this year when the consolidated financial statements come out because only then will we know how many trillions in guarantees have the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and other agencies made, and commitments and contingencies do we have related to all these bailouts? Because most of these didn't go through the budget. But they'll have to be disclosed under general accepted accounting principles. And so we'll see. But you know, we ain't seen nothing yet because it's, it's scheduled to get much worse if we don't start making tough decisions. Don't get me wrong. We're in a recession. We faced within the last year some unprecedented challenges with regard to financial institutions, with regard to housing and the ripple effect associated therewith. It was understandable and in fact necessary for government to take some action in order to try to deal with the crises in order to stimulate the economy. Now, frankly, we wasted a lot of money because we didn't do it the right way, because only a third of the stimulus was truly stimulus, because we didn't have clearly defined objectives, appropriate criteria and conditions for the money that went to these financial institutions and these other players, and so we wasted a lot of money. But my point is this. There was a need for government to act in light of the recession, in light of these unprecedented non-business cycle challenges, and it did act in order to avoid a depression. And so it can be said that having a higher level of deficits and accumulating debt in the short term is understandable, acceptable, but that's not our real problem. Our real problem is not the short term. Our real problem is the structural. The fact that based upon the existing size and nature of government, there is a large known and growing structural imbalance that exists that gets worse with the passage of time between how much money we're expected to have coming in and how much money we're going to pay out for two primary reasons. Demographics, and I want to thank you, Senator Domenici, being a good Roman Catholic. I'm a Roman Catholic. It's another thing we have in common. You, you are contributing more children and grandchildren to help our demographic challenge in this country. And so I want to thank you for that. I only have two children and three grandchildren, so I'm not carrying my load, okay? But, but you're, you're helping to offset me and many others. So, but demographics, the fact that in 1950 we had 16 people paying in for Social Security, every person taking benefits. Today it's 3.3 to 1. By 2030 it's going to be 2 to 1. Every to every man and woman who are married will have their own retiree to take care of in 2030. Okay, I'm just, you know, move on in. We're all in this together, okay? <laughs> the second is health care. If there's one thing that will bankrupt this country, it's health care cost. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that, but I'll save time for q We have two systems in this country that are incredible. One is our health care system. We spend double per person what any other industrialized nation does. We have close to 50 million uninsured. We have below average life expectancy, above average infant mortality, significantly above average medical error rates. And we spend 17 to 18 percent of our economy on health care headed up. Is there something wrong with that picture? So it's not a matter of money. We spend plenty of money. But we get below average results. Guess what? There's another system that's the same thing. Anybody want to guess what it is? The K through 12 education system. The K through 12 education system, we spend more money, get worse results. We're not top 20 in the world in math and science. And frankly, we're not doing a very good job with regard to financial literacy and civic responsibility either. And so these are things that we have to deal with. And what, what, what's my point? My point is we can't just make nip and tuck changes. We need radical transformational changes in installments over a period of time. Now, in health care, we're talking about adding coverage. Now, I'm all for a level of universal coverage. But universal coverage will not reduce cost. That is an oxymoron. You cannot reduce cost by expanding coverage because of a simple principle, math. 
you know, remember, remember what Einstein said. He was a pretty bright guy. One of the most profound things he said was, the most powerful thing on earth is not nuclear energy. It's the power of compounding. And if you're an investor, the power of compounding works for you. If you're a debtor, the power of compounding works against you. And I've already laid out the facts on that front. So, so what are we talking about health care? Yes, we need to achieve some level of universal health coverage. But I would argue a level that we, based on broad-based societal needs rather than unlimited individual wants, that we can afford and sustain over time. Preventative wellness and catastrophic. Yes, health care costs are the number one cause of personal bankruptcy, but that's cause of catastrophic cost. That's not because of normal recurring health care costs. We can afford and sustain preventative wellness and catastrophic. We cannot afford and sustain a Cadillac level of coverage, but yet that's what Washington talks about. We have a health care system today where Medicare alone has 38 trillion in unfunded obligations. 38 trillion. And we want to add? We ha let me envision our health care system. It's a house. It's a mansion. Let's call it the White House. It's built on a sinkhole of sand. It has a cracked foundation. The plumbing, leak, the, the plumbing leaks, the roof needs repair, and it's mortgaged for more than it's worth. So it is basically a structurally unsound and financially unsustainable system, this house. But what do we want to do? Let's add a new wing. Let's build it out of the same materials. Let's attach it to the same structure. And yes, we'll pay for it over 10 years. But what about beyond 10 years? And what about the tens of trillions of dollars in unfunded obligations that we already have? When are we going to figure out how we're going to pay for them? It's easy to eat your dessert. By the way, did you all eat your desserts here tonight? It's easy to eat the dessert. But we have to start eating our spinach. By the way, I like spinach. We have to start eating our spinach, and we have to recognize reality. You know, we're number one in the world on health care costs. You know the other thing we're number one on in the world in the health area? Obesity. Nobody's even close. That's not a good thing because obesity is a leading indicator of heart disease, diabetes, joint problems, among other things. We need to focus on cost first. And yes, we need universal coverage, but ultimately we need to achieve four things. Universal coverage for basic and essential. It's affordable and sustainable over time that won't bankrupt this country. We need to control cost. We need to reduce cost, reduce the rate of increase in cost, and get to the point where health care costs are not growing as a percentage of our economy. There is a limit of how much of our economy we can and should dedicate to health care and be competitive and have our standard of living improve. We need to move to evidence-based medical medicine. We need to change our payment practices to pay for results rather than doing more. We need to instill more personal responsibility for our own health and wellness. We need to be more responsible and accountable. Let me transition now to the Constitution. You know, this country was founded on some important principles, and I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'll just talk about a few personal responsibility. Today, too many Americans think they're entitled to things just because they're physically within this country. The country was founded on opportunity, not entitlement. At the beginning of this country, we had debtor's prisons. If you didn't pay your bills, you went to prison. Today, Bankruptcy is an exit strategy. You know, Vice President Biden, who I have respect for, tremendous respect for, says that if people don't end up using the stimulus money properly, he's going to shame them. 
Well, it might have worked in 1789, but I don't know if there's a whole lot of shame left. By the way, he hasn't been doing much of that lately. And so my point is, is that we need to recognize that this country was made great in, in, in large part because we didn't just live for today, we focused on the future and we helped to take steps to create a better tomorrow. That's called stewardship. And whether it's fiscal matters, whether it's environmental matters, whatever. The American dream, in my opinion, is not about owning a house. Now, I'm fortunate I own one, and it doesn't have a mortgage on it. It did, but it doesn't now, right now. But it, it really is more than that. It's about each and every one of us being able to achieve our full God-given potential. So it's opportunity. And it's stewardship. It's each and every generation have a responsibility to leave the country not only better off, but better positioned for younger people and for future generations. And for the first time in the history of the United States, that long-standing tradition is not being kept. This country is not today better positioned for the future from a fiscal, environmental, and other critical ways. And that must change. But for that to change, the first three words in the Constitution have to come alive. Anybody know what they are? We the people. We the people are responsible and accountable for what does or does not happen. We have a dysfunctional democracy. And the only way that we're going to be able to deal with this is if the power of the people says in large enough numbers that enough is enough. We need to get back to basic principles and values. We need to make sure that government is focused on areas that only government can handle. We need to take care of those who truly need help, but government should not promise more than it can deliver or try to do things that it has no competency in being able to do. Let me end on a positive note, uh, and, 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 and before I do give you this challenge. This is not just about numbers. It's about people. And to me, it's my three grandkids. I'm not worried about me. I'm a little bit worried about my son and daughter. I'm very worried about my eight-year-old, six-year-old, and three-year-old grandchildren. Because their future will not be as good as my present if we don't start dealing with these problems. And that's unacceptable to me. So it's not just an economic issue, it's a moral issue. We are mortgaging the future or future uh, of young people. We're engaging in massive taxation without representation because there's two kinds of taxes. There's current taxes and there's deferred taxes, and deficits are deferred taxes. That's what they are, with interest. And so we need to recognize the reality that we need to get our act together. The federal government needs to start leading by example. We need to put our financial house in order once we turn the corner on the economy, or else we could have a much bigger economic crisis, a much bigger economic crisis than we've seen in the next year. And it won't just be in the United States. It'll be global. But yes, we can succeed. We can reimpose tough budget controls like the ones that existed in the 1990s that took us from large and growing deficits to large and growing surpluses. We can reform Social Security to make it solvent, sustainable, secure, and more savings oriented. You will get Social Security. You'll get it at a later age, possibly in a somewhat different form. You'll get it. We can reduce health care costs. We can achieve those four objectives of coverage, cost, quality, and personal responsibility. We can reform our tax system to make it simpler, more equitable, more competitive, but to generate enough money to pay our bills and deliver on the promises that we intend to keep. We can re-baseline government, separate the wheat from the chaff between what government should be doing, what it shouldn't be doing, what works, what doesn't work, focusing on the future rather than perpetuating the past. We can do all of this, but the people are going to have to demand it. It's going to take extraordinary processes because the regular order does not work. Stay tuned in January. Uh, our foundation is fighting for America's future. Our, our website is pgpf.org, pgpf.org. Please check it out. 
We are fighting for America's future. We're fighting to promote f f uh, federal financial responsibility and personal financial responsibility. And in January, we will launch, and you heard it here first because we disagreed on this morning, the Come Back America campaign. In order to try to promote more responsibility and accountability today to create more opportunity tomorrow. In order to make the pain for political elected officials more for doing nothing rather than making tough choices that might involve some shared sacrifice for all today to create a better tomorrow. We must make the political price of doing nothing greater than the political price of doing something that will help keep this country great and make sure that we discharge our responsibilities to younger people and to future generations of Americans. Thank you very much. We have some time. Everybody, we have uh, some time for about four questions. And with uh, line with our policy tradition, we are going to let our student panel begin first. We have a question here. Do we have a microphone? Let's wait for our microphone. On its way. Good afternoon. My name is Cressa Mohammed. I'm a master's student here studying economics. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, you alluded to Americans' personal responsibility when it comes to their own finances. And my question is kind of twofold. Um, the savings rate being 5% is, is, is awesome, especially in the face of the constant message, you know, spend, spend, spend. That's going to be the only thing that drives the economy. But how do you maintain that, especially in an era where there's a you know, rumor we're coming out of the recession, but we're expecting high inflation and a falling dollar. So how do you maintain and increase that savings rate as we approach the coming months? Well, first, government is kind of duplicitous with regard to some of the things that it takes us. First, don't follow the example of your government. That's the first thing you do. You know, government does not lead by example. It spends more money than it makes, but it has the ability to do things that we can't do. It can print money, and it can raise taxes. All right, and it's going to do both, by the way, on a lot more people than people making $250,000 or more. Why? Math. It's that troubling word that just keeps coming back. The answer is this economy became overly dependent on personal consumption. We got too high. What, what did the government tell us to do after 9-11? Go buy stuff. I would respectfully suggest that was not the message that we needed to get after 9-11, but nonetheless, one can't change history. Look, here's what I think the situation is. Americans are ahead of their elected officials. The number two thing that Americans are worried about right after the economy is escalating deficits and debt, increased reliance on foreign lenders, uh, and they're scared. They're concerned about their security, the security of their families. That's one of the reasons they're consuming less, taking on less debt, saving more. I think we're going to see a change. I think Americans are going to save more than they did in the past, not be as bad on conspicuous consumption, be more prudent on their use of credit. Uh, and that means that, eight, that means that growth rates for the economy when we come out are going to be somewhat lower than historically they might have been, but potentially more sustainable if the government changes monetary policy and if the government changes fiscal policy. I have a lot more confidence in the Federal Reserve being able to change monetary policy when it needs to than I do uh, the legislative and executive branch changing fiscal policy. It's a real challenge because our greatest risk is inflation, uh, a significant drop in the dollar, uh, and the adverse consequences that could cause. Uh, and I think it's important that we listen to China, we listen to others. They're getting nervous about whether or not we're going to put our financial house in order. We're not going to default. This country's not going to default. But the question is, what's the dollar going to be worth that they're going to get repaid based on? All right? And by the way, if they figure out that we're not going to put our house in order, or if they're getting concerned about whether or not we will and when we will, then they will charge us higher interest rates through supply and demand. And with, but the numbers that I talked about, by the way, don't, in, don't, in, don't assume higher interest rates. So that would obviously even make it more challenging. I think we're going to have to have automatic savings as part of Social Security reform. My personal view is 
We need to reform Social Security to make it, to make it a defined benefit system. You're going to have to work somewhat longer to be eligible for the benefits. Strengthen it for people near poverty, somewhat less benefits on a relative basis for the middle and upper income. Uh, and we're, we're going to need to also add an automatic savings account on top that would go into a real trust fund. The government doesn't have trust funds. It has go trust the government funds. Uh, real trust fund with real investments, with real fiduciary responsibility and liability that would give people a pre-retirement death benefit, a supplemental retirement benefit, something to pass on to your heirs if for some reason you die before those funds are exhausted. But we need a defined benefit base because it is the foundation of retirement security and we need to make sure it's strong and secure. Hi, my name is Ana Villalobos and actually my question is somewhat similar to Crescent's question. Um, I really like the fact that you made mention that today is Constitution Day and I think unfortunately given the kind of society that we live in today, um, we've, we've made several uh, you know, references to the role of government, but I think that's something that we often forget or I don't think is men made mention enough is really also the kind of influence that corporations have as well in terms of in special interests in Congress. Um, and you know, when you talk to people and you kind of get a gauge of their knowledge regarding you know, the Constitution, civil liberties, things such as that nature, um, often you find that people are much more familiar with advertising slogans and their First Amendment rights. And I think that's you know, something very tragic in terms of what it means for the future of the nation. So we talk about spending and we talk about you know, being consumers. And I, I think there's some that would make the argument that throughout the course of time, we look at kind of the traditions that we had upon the foundations of our country and what we do today and how it's really shifted from being a nation of citizens to a nation of consumers. So how do we kind of shift it back to uh, being a nation of citizens to where, you know, as a consumer, I would argue that it's more of the individual versus as a citizen, much more of the collective thinking ahead, thinking yeah. for the vision of your country. How do we get back to that? Well, first, uh, we need to not just emphasize math and science. We need to emphasize financial literacy and civic responsibility uh, no later than high school. All right. Uh, we're not doing that now. Uh, we need to do that. Uh, but in addition to that, each of us need to lead by example in our own way. The federal government needs to do a better job of leading by example, which it's not. It's a laggard in that regard. But I think the other thing that we have to do is to recognize that we're going to need, uh, we're gonna need to, to change ourselves. Uh, we're going to need policy, operational, and political reforms to, to be able to address the challenges associated with our federal government. Uh, and in my view, we just may need another constitutional convention. Uh, but one that would be called for by a requisite number of the states and where in order not to open up Pandora's box where you don't know what you're going to get, where the states would authorize a vote on a short list of specific issues and their delegates would take on those short list of specific issues uh, to, to, help make, to help our democracy be more representative. That includes things like redistricting, campaign finance, and a variety of other issues. In order to put a limit on the federal credit card, we have no limit on the federal credit card now. We need a constitutional limit on the federal credit card. Actually, we have one. The Chinese just haven't told us what it is yet. My name, my name is James Hill from Western New Mexico University. I'm a, a county major over there. And what I've seen in the past is that increased taxes generally only leads to increased spending. And so with the taxes coming up, what can we do as citizens to get our government to pay down the debt rather than just spend more? All right. Well, first, uh, your bottom line statement is generally true. Uh, that's why, while I believe we need more revenues, and that means taxes among other things. You could do user fees or other things you can do, all right? I don't believe that we should send Washington any more money until two things happen. Number one, tough statutory budget controls are put in place to constrain spending and to force a re-examination of the base of government. Right, and number two, that we've actually we've put, a, we've put a process in place 
that will enable a grand bargain, which is what President Obama said he wanted to achieve, uh, to try to be able to achieve Social Security, health care, and tax reform in a way that we can make a big down payment or a big reduction in the $63 trillion plus in unfunded promises, gain some credibility and confidence to be able to go on and deal with the rest of it over a generation or more. I wouldn't send them more money until those things happen. But they're going to need more money. They're going to need more money, all right? Now, understand this. The longer we wait to achieve this grand bargain because of the miracle of compounding, the more changes we're going to have to make, the less transition time, the more potential risk of, of, of uh, foreign, comp foreign lenders losing confidence in us. The longer we wait, higher taxes are going to go. Let me tell you why. Three reasons. Number one, here's that sticky word again, math. Number two, uh, demographics. The more and more people will be enfranchised in existing entitlement programs, and therefore you won't be able to, tr to make as many changes otherwise you would like. And number three, political activism. Not all segments of society are equally politically active. For example, young people this last year were more active than they have been in a long time. But guess what? Not any more active than the other aspect of... In the, the turnout for this last election was higher across the board. And therefore, even though young people were more engaged than they had ever been, they weren't so much more engaged than everybody else that they really made that much of a difference. And so young people really got to, you got to really take it to a new level because we're talking about your future. Mr. Walker, thank you very much. We know it is a long trip from Washington, D.C. in many, many different ways to get down here to good old Las Cruces, New Mexico. And we wanted to, as a token of our appreciation, give you this tile for your home. Uh, this was developed by a famous artist here, Virginia Marie M Romero. And it's just one little token on behalf of us for you coming down to help us honor Senator Domenici. Beautiful. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Thank, thank you. you. Governor Carruthers, I want to keep rocking and rolling. Can we keep going? Can we keep going, Governor Carruthers? Let's just dispense with the break and ride on, roll on with Dr. Marin, can we? Let's do it. I want to, I think you couldn't have planned this. The preceding was a production of New Mexico State University. The views and opinions in this program are those of the author and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the NMSU Board of Regents.